Morning, everyone. My name is Anuj Kapoor. I am an assistant professor in the area of marketing at Jindal Global Business School, OP Jindal Global University. I welcome you all to the fifth webinar as part of the ongoing pandemic lecture series hosted by Center of Asia Pacific Business Research, Economics and Innovations at JGBS. I will be moderating today's webinar and the overarching theme for today's discussion is how the global pandemic has actually influenced consumer behavior with specific emphasis on the consumption in terms of product, services, and brands. It gives me immense pleasure to have Professor Lakhna Jayasinga as the speaker for today's webinar, and he will be sharing his views on the said topic. Dr. Lakhna is a professor of marketing and wise dean international at JJBS. Dr. Laknath gained his PhD in consumer anthropology at the University of Melbourne and MPhil in cultural studies at the University of Queensland. Professor Laknath teaches brand management and his uh, research applies a socio-cultural lens to understand how and when people engage with branded products and services. On behalf of all the participants and the team, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Laknath. Now, coming to all the participants, uh, what we'll be doing is, you know, feel free to ask whatever questions uh, that you have. Just type in your questions in the chat box that you would be having. We will be taking all of your questions towards the end of this particular discussion. So please make sure that you use the option of chat. Just put in your questions there and I will be more than happy to take all of your questions towards the end. Uh, now, so that is as far as the question is goes. Now I request, and another part, uh, I request all the participants if they can switch off their cameras and put their speaker phone on mute. Uh, and then moving on, I welcome Professor Laknath to start the discussion. The virtual dais is all yours. Great, thank you, Professor Anuj. That was a wonderful welcome, and um, <clears throat> welcome to everyone. Hi, welcome to everyone. I, I think I've seen some of my former students um, in, in this session, so hello, and ho hope everyone is well and safe in this very, I must say, incredibly surreal. I mean, we were just talking about me growing long hair. Totally unusual. <laughs> it's incredibly surreal, and. Uh, and sort of, I wouldn't say challenging. I mean, you know, it can be challenging, but yes, I hope you're all very well and safe during this time. <clears throat> um, I, just before I start, I want to acknowledge um, and extend a thanks to the uh, Centre for Asia Pacific Business Research, Economics and Innovation, headed by Professor Anuban Ganguly. And, uh, uh, Sorry, I'm just admitting a couple of um, people into the into the conversation, and uh, assisted very ably by Professor Chitrakalpa Sen, Professor Chitresh Kumar, Professor Minakshi Toma, and of course Professor Anuj Kapoor. So thank you very much. What I'm going to be talking about today is consumer behaviour going forward. Now, you know, people are asking, you know, what's going to happen in the world of business? I mean, we're, we're flooded with so many opinions and uh, some of them are considered, some of them are, you know, merely just opinions. So, you know, let's sort of work out, as they say in Australia, work out the wheat from the chaff, sort out the wheat from the chaff. And that's what I'll be talking about today. How do we actually, how do we think we will engage with brands going forward? and consume brands. Let me move through the presentation. Okay, so today's session will, I'll just very introduce, quickly introduce myself to those that do not know me or haven't engaged with me before, and then we'll get into the nub of why we're here to learn about branding, learn about brand, some, some aspects of brand management going forward. And as Professor Kapoor mentioned at the end, um, Please, please write down your questions as you're going through, if you have any, and then um, <clears throat> I'll be happy to field them at the end. A bit about me. Um, I'm a 
professor here in uh, here at JGU, Jindal Global University. I'm at the Business School, Jindal Global Business School, and I'm a professor of marketing. Um, I also hold a designation, a more administrative designation, Vice Dean of International Engagement here in our school. And um, being an Australian, um, I also hold the designation of Associate Director of Jindal Global University's Centre for India-Australia Studies. Um, I have a number of qualifications in this area, um, but just very quickly, some of you know where I've come from. Uh, I have a science degree. I, as an Australian, I grew up in, well, was born and grew up in Australia. I studied at my, for my first degree at the University of Melbourne. Um, my first degree was actually in the biological sciences uh, with a bit of sociology and politics, and dare I say it, also history and philosophy of science thrown in. Um, a very good sort of liberal arts complement to the technical sciences. I then went and worked for a couple of years before, sorry, I'm just having trouble with my slides here, before I went back and studied for a Bachelor of Business at Queensland University of Technology, a marketing, market, marketing major and a film and communications minor. And this is the moment in a way that I really, that really sort of sparked my interest and in this area, the sort of intersection between marketing and media, and I'm, I'm still here many, dare I say, decades later. Um, went and worked again for a number of years, this time in the advertising world, and came back um, later on, sorry, I'm having trouble with my animations, uh, to the University of Queensland, a top 50, I think, global university. Melbourne is a top, top 40. Um, University of Queensland is a top 50 global university and I did my master's research. It was a research dissertation in cultural studies housed in, an, uh, in the uh, Department of English. And my prof one professor was an English literature professor, another professor was a cultural studies professor and I was getting, getting a deep weight in cultural theory, which I later then married back at Melbourne University for my PhD in a, in a dissertation that married my cultural theory weight with my advertising background. I've taught at some Australian universities, you might be familiar with some of these. Um, Monash is a top 60 global. Um, University of Newcastle is in just two hours north of Australia, a beautiful part of the world. Um, more recently, before I came to Jindal, I was at Macquarie University for two and a half years um, teaching brand management and, and consumer behaviour and doing my research. Apart from the academic stuff, I also have 14 and a half, 40, 15 odd years now, commercial um, experience, mainly in advertising um, planning, media planning, but also since my MPhil, I've been doing quite a bit of consulting uh, and also full-time work in the area of brand strategy and consumer research. Those that know me know that I teach around brand management and consumer behaviour. Uh, I teach strategic marketing. I'm currently teaching a course here at Jindal Global Business School called Media and Society and Government. And of course, then I've also taught around advertising media and, uh, and media strategy. As Professor Kapoor in his introduction mentioned, my research really takes a consumer culture, sociocultural, applies a sociocultural lens on consumer behavior. And you know, this is sort of branded in the sort of marketing world as consumer culture theory, CCT is the sort of the brand name for the discipline. And um, so my research is sort of focused in that area. I published in the top tiers in my field Sorry, these animations are very sticky at the moment. Um, this is my paper from 2013, uh, published in uh, a top tier business school journal, the Journal of Consumer Research, um, which I was quite chuffed at. This was uh, based on my dis doctoral dissertation work. Uh, as the bottom purple point says, it was voted as a top 16 must read by an influential um, think tank composed of the major journal editors, the journal editors of the major journals, should I say, 
in marketing research, scholarly marketing research. So I was actually quite thrilled with that. More recently, I published in another top tier marketing um, journal, Marketing Theory, just a couple of months ago. Throughout my marketing history, my, my sort of practical experience, I've worked across a number of sectors and, you know, I don't want to sort of gloss over, I'll just gloss over these, I don't want to drill down too heavily, but just the categories I've worked through, these are the brands I've sort of worked with. You can see Kraft and Pamela, the global dairy juggernaut, great, great clients, big budgets and so on. Target and Kmart, the big discount department stores. Uh, Carlton Draft, beer, fantastic working on a beer account. Uh, Global Cosmetics, Maybelline, L'Oreal, Maybelline, Energy Companies, Energex, and one more, um, AGL up the top. Not-for-profits, um, Australian Red Cross and the Cancer Council of Victoria. Um, utilities as well, Australia Post, like your India Post. Uh, what else? Big banks, um, National Australia Bank, NAB. And then, of course, pharmaceuticals, Gilead, the global multinational, sometimes controversial pharmaceutical company, Big Pharma, Gilead, and Novartis. So I must apologise, these animations are sticky for some reason. Okay, I'll put this slide in here to talk about the reality because, you know, whenever we talk about what's happening post-COVID, we don't know. You know, we don't know. No one knows. And I say that not to devalue what I'm doing here, what we're doing with this series. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that you get a lot of snake oil, snake oil sales people out there who will purport to know it all. And all we can do is provide frameworks of understanding <coughs> to help organizations or people or other scholars. We can provide those frameworks. Um, <coughs> I would suggest to anyone who says they have the answer, stay well away, <laughs> we're very well away. Um, all we can do is, as I said, you know, we can guide people, you know, to perhaps have a look at this. This is what's happened. And some of the areas, as my three bullet points down the bottom say, you know, some of the areas we can look to are perhaps revisiting. Oh, I always say, you know, when you face a brand problem, when you face any problem, dare I say, in the commercial world, it's important to go back to the fundamentals. You know, um, you probably heard this at... <laughs> You know, when, when I was at school in Australia, you know, my math teacher used to say, go back to, go back to first principles. Well, it's the same thing here. Go back to first principles about, in my, through my presentation, consumer behaviour, brand behaviour. Go back to understand the fundamentals and look for how shifts are occurring amongst those fundamentals of brand or um, consumer behaviour. Another area we could look to is business history and, uh, you know, economic history in particular, how people have behaved post other pandemics, you know, similar in context, nothing actually is similar in context to what we're experiencing right now, but something that approximates what we're experiencing. I think that's really important. And the third one is perhaps we could look to nations that are currently easing restrictions, or nations, you know, across the globe that are currently easing restrictions, like my country, for example, Sydney and Melbourne. I don't want to say my country, this is my country now. But, um, you know, Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, for example. And you know what? When I look at what's happening in Sydney and Melbourne, and, and you know, you think about the fundamentals of consumer behaviour and how people are behaving post-COVID, if that's what it is, in, in Sydney and Melbourne, and there are pockets of outbreaks still occurring in those two cities, not a lot's changed, you know. As I hate to break the news, not a lot's changed. Um, we might have, you know, in Sydney and Melbourne, in other, uh, other cities around the world, we might have some restrictions, short to midterm, I imagine and I hope, but essentially people are still going about their regular, trying to go about their regular consumer behaviours. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm much more circumspect. I'm 
dare I say, old enough, not, not, not gray haired old enough, but I'm old enough to sort of be more circumspect about the waxes and wanes in, in, in sort of discourse around these things. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about, you know, five ways through which we perhaps will engage with branded products and services going forward um, through this pandemic. And <clears throat> here I want to signal some influences to what I'm going to talk about. These are influences that have, over the years, over the decades, guided my thinking and, uh, and brought me to you know, this, this point in time where I'm sort of imparting some sort of not just tactical ideas, but also some sort of broader philosophical ideas, I guess. And these are some works that have guided and helped me, you know, shape my thinking. The first is this wonderful book. Um, it's Schumacher, a British statistician from uh, the 50s to the 70s and beyond. Um, this is his wonderful book from 73, Small is Beautiful, a subtitle, The Study of Economics as If People Mattered. And the reason I'll put this here is because when we think about marketing and consumer behaviour, um, the disciplinary inheritance of the field of marketing is really economic psychology for the most part. That's not the perspective I naturally come from, but the mainstream frameworks and theories gain their disciplinary inheritances from um, traditional economic theory, economics theory. And so I put this up here because I think it's a wonderful small book, wonderfully easy, easy to read, hard to think about, <coughs> challenging. But I put that here because this has guided my thinking for, for quite a while. Here's another one. This is my beautiful, um, beautiful anthropologist, um, Ruth Benedict, who is long dead, both Schumacher and Ruth have long departed, but she has informed, that's, you know, I put that, that picture, that graphic up there to signify that I'm, you know, I've read the original, I haven't. That's my copy up here, you know, fresh, sort of fresh, about 20 years old. But um, she's one of the grand old scholars in, American cultural anthropology. Um, her work in 1934, Patterns of Culture, was seminal, absolutely seminal, in, in um, um, really setting in play a whole number of ways that today we think about behave, human behavior, including, might I say, a huge mainstay of consumer behavior or consumer research, as the discipline might call itself. I'm just going to read just the first line to set the scene here, the first line of her text. This is talking about anthropology in 1934. Anthropology is the study of human beings as creatures of society. Creatures of society. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, so what we actually, what my talk is going to talk about is how it's going to frame us as consumers as creatures of society. Okay, so that's the sort of perspective I'm taking here. Another one that's come about, and this is more recent, this is Jeffrey Sachs. Many of you, particularly the economists, but those involved in or, or interested in questions of this nature will be familiar with his work. He's from uh, Columbia, high profile professor of economics at Columbia University in New York. This is his three part series of lectures he gave to the LSC in 20. 17 on trying to embed a, a, a frame within the framework of economics. And as I mentioned before, the frameworks, traditional frameworks of economics have come to influence the mainstream frameworks of marketing. So he's, he's been on about in the last couple of years trying to embed virtue and wisdom, right, within the, the disciplinary frameworks of economics absolutely wonderful and challenging and riveting stuff. In my field of marketing and consumer research, this is David Glenn Mick, who uh, a number of years earlier than, than uh, um, Jeffrey Sachs' series of lectures, this is 2009, in a journal called the Journal of Macro Marketing. Uh, David Glenn Mick 
published this paper along with his co-authors. Richard Lutz is a you know global brand in in it himself in uh, terms of marketing scholarship. They themselves are exploring these ideas of trying to embed marketing theory, embed into marketing theory, consumer research, consumer behaviour theory, the notions of virtue. How can we, you know, because these are these aren't just academic questions, because these frameworks and theories later go on to underpin the theories that are used and frameworks in econometric modeling that the big consultancies use, whether they're the big four accounting firms, the big five management consultancies, the top three elite management consultancies like McKinsey's and so on, the top tier advertising agencies, even the bottom tier ad agencies, they all use these frameworks in their modeling. So it's not some sort of abstruse theoretical point I'm making. This is vital if we shift the framework, embed the framework with ideas of virtue and wisdom and try and cultivate a sense of as David Mick once said at a conference I attended, try and make marketing, uh, try and use marketing as a tool for human flourishing. Right? People go, holy shit, how do we do that? You know, but that's wonderful if we can do that. You know, and that's sort of the perspective I come from here. This book's another seminal influence in my thinking. This came out in 2004, Doug Holt, uh, was a hero to my generation of uh, budding consumer anthropologists who did their PhDs in the mid 2000s. He, at the time, was at where was he? Uh, HBS, Harvard Business School. Then he moved to Said School of Business at Oxford. And now he's retired and he's a consultant. And he's the first one who actually developed a framework for brand management, actually for brand management firms, advertising agencies, brand strategy firms to actually take the principles developed, uh, take the principles developed from say areas like cultural studies or cultural anthropology or the cultural and social qualitative end of sociology and embed them into consumer research. So his tome, I call it, his tome of, the, um, of that moment was called How Brands Become Icons, a wonderful, wonderful read. These are some of the totems that have helped me inform my, that, that have informed my work. So they're sort of the signposts through which I'm going to talk about five, not 10, five ways through which uh, um, consumer behavior may shift if that's indeed what we're gonna talk about going forward. And the first way is, how are we going for time? The first way is by looking at, uh, by developing a more contextualized, socially and culturally contextualized sense uh, of branding, one that carries much more social meaning. And I'll talk about why this is important, but let me talk about where this idea of brand and brand meaning comes from. So the first way we talk about brand meaning is developed from these two fellows, these two handsome grand men, scholars of marketing research. The one on the left there is David Arker, and the one on the right is Kevin, the legendary Kevin Keller, um, <clears throat> who might I say managed an Aussie rock, one of my favorite Aussie rock bands back in the day. So he's an even more, more of a hero to me. But these two men really set the scene for traditional perspectives of brand management. And that was formed through this notion of brand equity. Many of you who've done BBAs, MBAs, will have come through the, either the Archerite perspective or indeed the Kellerite perspective through these two texts. This is Kevin Keller's seminal text. I teach, um, I teach brand management through the, one, the text on the left, for example, right? My criticism of this perspective that he, is that at root is the individual consumer, the one derived from um, classical economic theory, homo economicus, as we sort of more either pejoratively or more vernacularly call her or him. Um, and here the focus, particularly in the Keller text, this one, 
is really on adapting the ARCA right perspective of, of brand equity to something that Keller calls customer, individual customer brand based uh, equity, based brand equity, should I say, CBBE. And the root of that is housed as my scheme diagram here, the, the, the root of that is housed in this psychological entity called um, brand knowledge. And brand knowledge is really uh, refers to the brand knowledge housed by Homo economicus, the, 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 the all information holding uh, individual consumer trying to maximize her or his sense of utility. However, we define that as satisfaction or happiness or whatnot. And the two mainstays from the Keller perspective around brand equity is brand awareness and brand image. So this is sort of the traditional perspective of brand meaning. Brand meaning is linked to brand, brand equity. Brand equity is linked to brand knowledge from a um, cognitive and social psychology perspective that has its disciplinary roots in economics. And brand knowledge is composed of brand awareness and brand image. Okay, I won't go into the sort of further, I won't splinter it down first, further. And you know, this is sort of the def definition that uh, from Keller's text that it's the differential effect of the cu individual customers' brand knowledge, how's the brand image and awareness, on that individual customer's responses to brand marketing stimuli, whether it's um, how they watch an ad, an individual consumer watches an ad and the meanings they create from, from that with regard to awareness or image, or um, <clears throat> how they react to product features, or how they might react to store design, or some, some, some specific marketing stimuli or tactic. Now, as the last point on this slide says, this has been massively influential, totally. I mean, you know, these two, Arca and, and uh, uh, Keller have the market, not only have the market, on, on, on the purchase of ideas, but they have the mar market on the literal purchase of textbooks in the field. And they've been the main two players over the last three, yeah, three decades. And you can imagine then that the, you know, three decade generations of scholars coming out of BCOMs or BBAs or MBA programs have come out with the Archerite perspective, or indeed now for the last two decades, the Kellerite perspective of brand equity. And so they've been influential, as it says, in developing a very much a managerial approach, both, both texts are managerial approaches um, to the, that cultivate a managerial based notion of an individual's brand based behavior. <clears throat> and that in, individual might be consuming brands or engaging with brands either alone in solo sort of consumption situations, or in group settings. But the disciplinary inheritances of those perspectives are cognitive and social psychology. From there, we move to a completely different space from now, from here on. Um, these two perspectives, the Archerite and the Keller, do not, as my last point on the screen says, don't account for new developments in brand research, new, what I call fascinating developments from the world, the qualitative end of brand management research or brand research. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you know, that come the, the disciplinary inheritances of these new perspectives coming might come from, say, cultural studies, cultural anthropology, the qualitative end of sociology, literary studies, literature, history, historical studies. Philosophy, you know, um, so it just doesn't include these, the, the, the Archerite and Keller perspectives. I don't want to say neglects. I mean, that's not, that's being a bit unfair, but essentially they, the, the, the mainstay of this research neglects these new developments. And these new developments really link on to, as the heading on this slide says, the socioculturally contextualized approaches to brand meaning. Now this is completely a different set of meanings that I 
than what I just talked about. These are meanings that link to what we call the brand culture approach. And you know, as the four bullet points in purple suggest, these understand, you know, this brand culture approach, for example, works of Doug Holtz. I mentioned the Doug Holtz book, How Brands Become Icons. Um, you know, these are brands as cultural particles, and therefore they work as cultural particles, uh, indeed, like film or television programming or popular music or indeed alternative, what you might call alternative music, or indeed fashion, or indeed um, <clears throat> novels, literature, magazines, right, memes, right? These are all cultural particles and brands themselves embed themselves in our popular culture and function that way and the produce, as a second point there says, um, contextualized, deeply contextualized sociocultural meaning for the consumer. And these meanings are socially embedded meanings, right? These are, brand, uh, uh, these are ways of understanding brands, for example, as my third bullet point there says, as identity symbols, the ways that we might wear brands, you know, to signal to others about some part of ourselves, right? Um, importantly, the viewpoint here, as opposed to Homo economicus, the viewpoint, the disciplinary sort of lens applied onto understanding um, a user of brands, a consumer of brands. And when I say consumer, I don't just mean the, the you know, literal intake, digestion. I mean, you know, how we engage with, how we use, how we, the meanings we create from, how they are personalised. And the disciplinary perspective here is of an individual as a component of, importantly, an individual as a component of and embedded in a social network or collective. Right? So you can sort of see the difference. Homo economicus being the root person that's behind much man or woman, or indeed now I teach gender, a course called gender and consumption, you know, masculine or feminine, we can move beyond cisgenders to transgenders, men or women or uh, anywhere between, embedded in a component of or, or uh, as a component of embedded within a social network or collective, right? So the individual is part of the collective, not an individual, important distinction. And this brand meaning approach, as the second point there says, argues that brands are part of culture and, and, and are vessels, they're carriers of ideas, they're vessels of ideas that create not individualized meanings of particularly brand image um, or brand awareness. That may also occur, that may also occur and indeed often does. I'm not here to discount the Keller or Arkwright perspective. I'm saying, they go hand in hand. But what they do is not create individuals, but also a socialized brand meaning, what we call a co-created. The brand plus the individual socialized meanings to come together to create a socialized sense of a brand meaning. And this is seen to particularly hugely, particularly since the, uh, the, the, the publication of Holt's book in 04, 2004, we have seen in industry, I have used in industry, I've worked in, in, in Australian ad agencies where they are actively using the Holt framework. You know, it's amazing. And, and the reason is, is because this is seen, this framework is seen to greatly enhance the impact on brand building and brand positioning. There's much more specificity, much more naturalism, right? And it's embedded in the, the, the sort of worldview, the brand meanings are embedded within the worldview of the consumer. Now I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm going to ask um, Professor Anuj to share a link with you all to the first, uh, first uh, clip that I want you to watch. This is Nike. Some of you actually in my classes might have uh, seen this uh, um, 
might have seen this before. This is Nike's wonderful campaign, uh, Nike India's wonderful campaign for 2016 called Da Da Ding. It's about two minutes, 50 seconds. I want you to watch the full thing. And in particular, we'll, we'll come to this small discussion afterwards, but I want you to look at how, well, what the campaign's about is, this is 2016, the brand is inserting itself into a broader cultural narrative conversation in this country of the place of women in Indian society. What they're trying to do is inspire young women, Indian women, to embrace sports as a part of what they do, right? So if you can watch that now, and we'll come to a discussion, full discussion about it afterwards. Um, it's about two and a half. So I'll come back on in three minutes, okay? All right, so everyone, what I've done is I've just pasted the link of video one uh, in the chat window at the bottom of your screens. So you may just you know, want to open that particular link. As Professor Laknath mentioned, it's about two minutes, 50 seconds. So we'll again, so just have a look at the video and then we'll again uh, connect post that. Okay, so I must apologize. We're just having streaming issues with the videos. So um, we're gonna to have to do it a bit more in a, in a more clunky fashion. You know, we, we give you the links to watch in your own space and so on. So I hope you've all watched the video. And I mean, I, I must say I've watched this about 20 times, this clip, examined it 20 times in class and in seminars and so on. And I, I, I am continually Lord by it. Um, <clears throat> of course, Nike has worked out that one way to, I mean, they try to grow their market in this country. And one way to do that is by including half the population <laughs> in the conversation. But they've also worked out that, you know, the, the way they've done that is to enjoin the broader conversation about that's occurring. This is 2016 the broader conversation that was occurring in the country at the time uh, about the place of women in the country and the role and, um, you know, the, the sort of legitimacy granted to females. And they understood very e early on that the, 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 you know, the imagery, for example, in the campaign acts, for example, as the, the particles of mass culture that themselves, some of the imagery, some of the sort of the, the forcefulness of the, the, the visuals, the, the music and so on, they act as they or they produce, should I say, new sociocultural meanings, particularly off the place of women in sport here, uh, in a moment where take out cosmopolitan India, but apart from cosmopolitan India, the place of women in sport is not really a legitimated sort of field. Um, and in particular, what they've also done is they've, um, <clears throat> they've, looked, they've built an ad that works through um, representing um, through the identity symbol, as symbols associated with the ad. And here, let's not forget ourselves that this is an ad for Nike and the Nike logo in this instance can represent um, or through this instance, can represent some form of female empowerment um, in, in this country. Right? Now, brands can take on different meanings in different contexts, but through this ad, what they're trying to do is build that idea, that, um, uh, that notion of female empowerment through the, let's put it this way, quite boldly or bluntly, that uh, if you wear a Nike piece of 
item, you are actually displaying a certain sense of identity credential. Okay, so that's the first example. The second example is, you know, it's not a clip. It's um, the Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola's Share a Coke campaign from um, two, two to three years ago uh, here in India. And Coke very much realized, you know, um, that the, 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 their brown fuzzy liquid, their, their brown fuzzy drink is something that's shared between friends. It's a, it's a product that helps bond people together. And we'll talk about this in a moment. And they also recognize that relationships develop and evolve over, year, over the years. So for example, you know, father and son, you know, dyad, if we use the sort of research terms, a father and son couple, couplet, um, can become not, um, it doesn't have to be an intergenerational um, friendship, it can be, you know, a normal social friendship that develops from that. And this is what this campaign aim, aimed to do, it's sort of form, help form or help bridge or help bond, um, you know, help cement friendship networks. And what they were doing and actively in the brand communication sort of media sort of um, talk around this they, was that they were helping to celebrate social relationships. So this is another way through which uh, very much brands attempt to personalize, right, um, brand meaning through contextually specific, contextually socialized brand meaning. The second one, and this digs deeper into you know, this, this point I just made, is that brands create linking value, linking, social linking value. And you know, if we think about the traditional perspective, managerial perspectives of brand value, um, I'd mentioned on my earlier slides, this links, to, this links to something around brand image or brand levels of brand awareness, for example, uh, of a consumer around the brand. That's fine and that's quite useful work, but what recent research is also demonstrating is that brand consumption signals value through symbolic membership of social groups. For example, we have, this is your brand, iconic motorcycle brand, Royal Enfield, based out of the south of this country, a British brand originally now sort of taken up by the Indians. And this is, you can see they're all very much practicing social distancing. This is um, the brand in Thailand. The brand has migrated offshore. And uh, this is Royal Enfield. You can see this group of consumers. They've very much formed a brand community, a brand, the, the brand management team in Thailand. And what they do, they get together in so great social distancing fashion and cycle around the country, um, visiting you know, tourist sites and so on. And this is engineered by the organization to embed people <coughs> into a collective based around the brand so that you know, the social bonds uh, are strengthened, social bonds around the brand are further strengthened. Um, I'll put the link, uh, a citation there to Kath um, Catherine Twanley's work with Ruhi Siddharth uh, from Flame University. This is coming out of the Topsy Anthropology Journal, Social Science Journal, Modern Asian Studies that looked at the notion of how young females, young adult females in India, through their consumption practices, develop a sense of respectable femininity within their social groups. You know, what sort of styles of dress and what dress? You know, they wear denim in some occasions and you know, um, traditional, more traditional ethnic Indian wear in others. Um, <clears throat> sometimes brands are used as resources to connect with like-minded others. This is uh, Absolute Vodka um, in India. At the time of the de decriminalization of, uh, of LGBT um, same-sex sexuality, let's put it that way, um, in 20, 2018. And they came up, uh, Absolute Vodka has been a long-term supporter of the global LGBT causing community. And this is, one way through which the brand was able to express their brand legitimacy, their legitimacy 
of the brand to these uh, LGBT consumers at the time of decriminalization here in India two years ago. More recently, this is, that was Stephen Cake's work from the journal Consumer Research. More recently, in the same journal, Samuel Sarsen uh, Apo and his co authors from Melbourne in the same journal published work that looks at uh, individuals and what happens, they call it the individual, right? The sort of split sort of sense of the individual. What happens when an individual is embedded within? moments of liminality, that sort of this in-between and betwixt moments people experience from time to time in their lives. Airports are, for example, the great moment of liminality, you know, you're, you're neither here nor there. And uh, they look at it in the context of Pentecostal Christianity, you know, as you can see there, everyone's sort of doing their hallelujah to God. <clears throat> um, so, you know, people come together essentially through various brands to share, as my point there says, to connect with like-minded people. And in um, Uppo's work, Uppo and Etel's work coming forthcoming, they look at what happens to the sense of the self, when that happens in sort of these moments of transition for people. Importantly, as the last point there says, um, and this links to this idea of Linkin Valley, how do we operationalize this? How can firms use this? Well, it's that contribution, right? The increased contribution to the strengthening of the social bond, we can measure that, is linked to increased linking value, right? So an increased strength, strengthening of the bond, the more that the brand enables that bond to firm up, right? Those bonds between people in the collective there's greater value, linking value that firms can trade upon if we use that word. Um, this is Calvin Klein, and this is actually from this, this year. This is a very interesting campaign uh, at a couple of levels. And perhaps before, I, before we send you the link, uh, it's a clip that came out, a campaign that was launched in, 20, in March 2012, just a couple of months ago. It's a start started. Cass, Lil Nas, Kendall Jenner, as you can see, Justin Bieber, uh, Mulema, Lei Zhang, the Chinese pop singer, because of course CK is driving into the Chinese market in a big way, or embed themselves there in a big way. Um, this is a celebration, I mean, it's quite, I mean, from my point of view, a narcissistic campaign, a celebration of self love and ultra overt self confidence. So perhaps. I want you to watch this and think about how it may link to, to, to identity, uh, an individual's notion of self-identity when they view this and they may say, oh, you know, Calvin Klein has these brand values uh, embedded within it. And then we'll come back to a small uh, discussion after. So if I can ask uh, Professor Anuj to link the clip, this goes for one and a half minutes. So everyone, please refer to the chat window again. I have just posted the link to the video being referred by Professor Lucknow. Okay. So we'll come back. Uh, I hope you've all watched the clip. As you can see, it's quite a powerful clip that's very, very charged with what I would say, um, with, with the charge with the brand values of Kevin Klein. Um, so at one level, this works to signal individual social identity within a collective, right? An individual's sense of social identity within a collective. What I'm interested in here, and I'm bringing this closer to home, is how here at Jindal Global University, before we all broke off into a COVID semester break in mid-March, what I was interested in was how Calvin Klein became the brand du jour amongst the student population. It just seemed that if a year ago it was um, <coughs> Pepe Jeans, if a year ago it was, Pepe, if it was Pepe Jeans, and that sort of moved off, it sort of 
product lifecycle loss that within the JGU community has morphed and moved. This year, over the last six months, it seems to be CK. Most people seem to be wearing a CK top wherever they go. And I found this interesting as a brand researcher, as a consumer researcher, like what's going on? And what it really is, it's about signaling to others. We all signal, we all signal through our comportment and the way we dress, the way we style ourselves, either shabbily or not. It's signaling symbolic membership to the, the dare I say, it, the JGU club, the JGU student body that, hey, I'm one of me, I'm one of us. You know, this sort of idea, you know, by wearing a, an accoutrement of um, <clears throat> CK clothing, a t shirt or jeans or whatnot, you know, having a little satchel. So I found this interesting, this campaign sort of you know, the, both the individual embedded within a social network, a social community, but also here at Jindal Global University, CK wear has been used to signal, hey, I'm like you, or these are the collective brand values that we work with. I want to talk about two things here that um, are related about global brands. Um, they're sort of, um, they're not competing theses, they're sort of complementary. And the first is that um, if we sort of push harder from this idea of linking value, the first is that brands act as, you know, brands, uh, I've titled this slide, the brands work as consumption of global modernity, and I'm talking global brands here. What I mean by that is that brands work into this notion of global consumer culture, which is patterned on particular what, what you know, anthropologists and sociologists call global flows of cultural resources. This comes from Arjun Upadure's work, the great cultural anthropologist from the US, his work from the, the 1990s, cultural flows of media images, cultural flows of or, or even flows off um, finance scapes, he says. You know, you have to have the embedding of global finance systems, right? Embedded here, say in India, in Sonipat, for example, for for you know, to enable people to purchase things through a global network. Um, global ideologies, global technoscapes. You know, now we all have sort of things like this: a smartphone for example. Um, these are what he calls the global flows of cultural resources. We use them as cultural resources. Images, for example, and ideologies figure very much into this. And this sort of templates global consumer culture. And, you know, the second point there talks about brands in, embedded in this culture as, this is a wonderful phrase from Rick, Rick Wilk from Indiana University, wonderful consumer anthropologist heading up the Department of Anthropology there. He talks about brands or yeah, particles of consumer culture in, in, in global consumer culture being, um, as he calls it, ubiquitous global structures of common difference. And brands very much are that. Ubiquitous global structures. They've, you know, they've got global templates, global ways of understanding brands, but there's a common difference. And this under this awkward phrase, but sort of gets you to think, um, intimates that both the local and the global, or should I say the global and the local, right? Common difference. There's a commonality, a globalized structure to this, but there's a difference in that they're very much localized as well, localized, localized. Um, the ways that firms do this, right, work with this, and I'll show you wonderful clip, just a short clip in a moment, is that they very much imbue these, um, and I like this phrase, these globally resonant myths of, and when I say myths, I don't mean to say that the, 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 the narratives are wrong, right? That's not what I mean by myths. Myths are particles of culture that structure a collective understanding within that culture. And uh, this is what global brands do. You know, they very much imbue 
their brands with these globally resonant myths of individual independence, senses of modernity. This is the striving to achieve some sort of globalness. You know, I have my Apple iPhone. I'll show you an Apple ad in a moment. Um, I, I gain some sense of self-actualization through being a part of this global consumer culture. You know, I can go to Singapore or Stockholm or Sydney indeed and come back to, there's another S word in India, Shimla, that doesn't work. But anyway, um, and come back and tell my friends and, you know, they'll all understand because they themselves understand if we're all working within this ideology of globalism, they will understand these aspects of um, self-actualization or independence achieved through the global marketplace. And importantly, this notion of global modernity is both a process and an ideology. It creates brand meaning, right? It's both a process and a mean form of meaning making. And, it can, and, it, and, and it's continuing, it's continued in the past, in the past, it's continuing right now, and indeed, my sense is it'll continue into the future as we will see in a moment. <clears throat> if I can click through. Okay. This is Unico, and again, if I can get Professor Anuj to, uh, to uh, link the clip for you in your chat function. This is just a short clip, 30 seconds. What I want you to take from this is how Uniqlo, in the 30 seconds, this is UK, Uni, Uniqlo UK from 2016. It's not from now, four years ago. But I want you to think about as, as, uh, um, <clears throat> as you're watching this, these notions of, for example, individual independence, self-actualization through this sort of global brand that, you know, the, the, what they're wearing could be seen in Sydney or indeed Stockholm or Shanghai or Singapore, right? So uh, over to you, Prof um, Anuj. Yes, the video uh, link uh, I've already pasted. So video three on YouTube, please refer to your chat box windows at the bottom of the screen. Okay. So as you were watching, I really hope you sort of saw the elements of independence and modernity. You know, these are people that are using, as I said, the accoutrements of the marketplace to signal to both themselves and to others that they are achieving some sense of a global standard of achievement and accomplishment and indeed um, use the brand, uh, as you can see, very much is self-evident in this clip, use the brand as a tool for self-expression and individual self-expression as well. You can sort of see through this self-expression elements of the notion of self-actualization are written into the brand story. And here we have to understand, for example, how um, myths and narratives, various myths and narratives uh, that, that are written in, right, written in to brand communication sustain themselves in, you know, different countries or indeed communities. Okay, this is Apple. This again is, uh, I think it's on my notes here, it's, it's about a minute and a bit. This is Apple. Um, this actually came out a couple of weeks ago, April 2020. And it's very much written within, sorry, written, created within a COVID moment. And of course, the title of the clip is called Creativity Goes On. Interesting title. We'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, but as you're watching, I want you to look out for the, the moment where Oprah Winfrey talks a bit about something. I'll leave that up to you to, 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 to uh, watch. So again, over to you, Professor Anuj. And um, I'll see you all back in about one minute, 40 seconds. Yes, all the participants, the link to video four, you would find uh, in your respective chat boxes. Clip and um, <clears throat> take a note of things that are happening there. And 
what I found interesting about this clip, two things. One, it was written, created during this COVID moment, explicitly for this COVID moment. Creativity goes on. There's symbolism even in the title of the, uh, the, the, the advertisement, the brand communication piece. Um, I was particularly interested in, in how the, cap the brand communication piece tries to capture the notion of individual self-expression, individual independence, indeed, dare I say, individual self-actualization through a, a constellation, or should I say global constellation of practices using the Apple brand. When Oprah Winfrey came on and spoke, I, I actually thought she is nailing this perspective. She nailed it when she said, um, you know, uh, it's amazing how things, you know, we've come together in ways that we would never have thought we would. And um, she nails this. And it's this idea that life, creativity, and indeed global, for our senses, global consumer culture and global modernity goes on. I mean, you know, these, these, these are brands that are going to shy away from or retract from the global from the discourse of, or the ideology, dare I say it, of globalism. Sorry. <laughs> okay, counter to that is this notion of brands as resistance to global modernity, right? And this is a sort of, as I said, they're not, they're sort of not competing. They're, they're sort of complementary, these sorts of uh, practices. On the one hand, you have those that believe in globalism and global modernity and global consumer culture, and that will keep going, I believe. And then you've got those who are critiquing it and resisting this ideology and the spread of global brand culture. And the work from Vermin and Belk, Rohit Vermin from IMC, Kolkata, uh, and Russ Belk, published in JCR, Journal of Consumer Research in 20, 2009, looks at the... Uh, at some level, the, some segment of the Indian population looks at how they view Coca-Cola as a culturally imperialist brand and coming in to sort of erode traditionally Indian values. And they, you know, can, they perform various consumer boycotts of the brand. Some of the research I did in that article I mentioned before from 2013 in the Journal of Consumer Research looks at how Australian middle class consumers sort of a very, you know, there's a tension, you know, they don't, they, they enjoy brands, but they also consider that brands and brand culture has gone too far. So there's this sort of anxiety around it. What we see right now in the global press around this retreat, if I call it, from globalism is really a couple of things. And I, I, I personally don't want to overplay it because I don't think, my, my personal feeling is that this will be a continuing discourse, but um, it'll, yeah. it'll be modified in a way. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I think the anxieties that we see, <coughs> sorry, let me phrase that another way as it, it's there on the slide. This resistance that we see, this retreat from globalism that we see in the press and so on, this sort of around global consumer culture is motivated, motivated by an anxiety at first blush around the risk to life from COVID. Okay, that's fair. We, we're all concerned about that. But I think if we peel, we peel the, the onion skill skin a bit further off, we see that there's broader discourses underneath this. And this is sort of the fears of the cultural imperialism, um, sort of anti-corporate interests and that, you know, harks back to the work from Naomi Klein and others from the late 90s and Juliet Shaw from Boston College and her hugely influential work around anti-globalization and anti-consumption that she talked about. And others, even in the marketing literature, you know, the top tier marketing literature are sort of saying, well, there's got to be a limit to consumption, you know, that this quest for endless growth of firms and brands, there's got to be. And 
kind of for me sympathetic, of course, to that perspective. Um, you know, there's the questions of environmental degradation and all of this in, in the service of what? You know, fast fashion, you know, and I'll come to a brand, a fast fashion brand in a moment. But, you know, this is sort of the discourse. Now, a lot of research has been done on this and, you know, the, 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 the sort of great chunk of the research done on this is whilst there's sort of there's the critique of it and saying, you know, this is bad. There's the uh, notion that the, the, the difficulty in sensing genuine resistance is because the juggernaut of global capitalism, global consumer capitalism is just so vast and so marauding. And, and I use those terms, I use those terms, global juggernaut marauding, and it will co-opt it will co-opt and indeed does. I didn't show you here a wonderful clip, which I show in my media classes and my brand management classes, a clip from Pepsi 2017. You can check it out on YouTube, featuring Kendall Jenner, who seems to be everywhere these days. And Kendall Jenner um, <clears throat> and, and, and the, 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 the sort of storytelling narrative of the clip was about how Kendall, Kendall Jenner <laughs> joins the global protest movement and she's sort of the savior. And of course the brand campaign didn't last one moment. It was pulled within one day because Pepsi very much <laughs> realized that to have Kendall Jenner was the wrong ambassador. But the broader point I want to make is that the global protest movements themselves are being co-opted, right? Into identity emblems consumer identity emblems themselves, right? And we see this with the IDF memes around what's called do doppelganger brand images, which are just, if I just can just show you. Well, actually, this is an, another example from my, my country, Australia. This is uh, one of our larger, large newspapers. This is their property section from 2015 about minimalist living, right? The sort of um, Con Marie, Marie Kondo, uh, Japanese style of living minimalistly, minimalistically. Um, it's been co-opted as another consumer identity, right? And here we have, for example, um, you know, these are, the internet's replete with these memes that are really double grammar brand images that take, uh, take the piss, to, to use the Australian phrase, take the piss out of uh, global brands and sort of make a point. But, you know, do they really do much? Do they really change? Are they really changing, you know, brand preferences, particularly when brands themselves are co-opting these images and identities back into their brand communications? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not thoroughly convinced that this is the way to go, resistance and critique. Um, you know, as I say, global consumer culture to me is too marauding, too, too powerful. And they understand the nuances of consumer behavior too well. Okay, my last one before we go to Q&A is this idea of ethics. Ethics is becoming so important. And fascinatingly enough, we don't even teach ethics to the extent that we should in business schools. It's sort of seen as a byline in a business school curricula. Um, but consumers are demanding that brands behave ethically. Um, and you could argue that this is co-opted again by consumers into their own senses of identity. I am an ethical consumer, for example. But I don't want to be cynical about that. As my second point there says, consumers and citizens expect, we expect brands to be held accountable to the claims they make. And now through smartphone culture, we can actually talk back to brands. There's a, you know, I'm sort of jumping around with my points a bit. Um, as the last bullet point says, there's a potential, very easy potential for brand trouble when brands transgress, ethically transgress, as, as indeed um, the, the example I gave you of Pepsi with uh, Kendall Jenner, um, being co-opted to represent the global protest movement. Um, when, when that occurred, the brand was jumped on by 
for consumers globally and the brand, the campaign was pulled. Um, <clears throat> the third point is interesting. Consumption nowadays is seen as, dare I say, it, an ethic, ethical and symbolic act, but it's also a performative act. It's there to say, hey, this is me. This is my values being writ large on the screen, right? Um, or dare I say, through my consumption practice. Um, but I don't want to downplay the, 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 the notion of ethical consumption because it is hugely important in how we behave and we are holding brands to account. The most famous examples here, of course, are Ben & Jerry's, the ice cream brand from the US that has imbued their values with less, less liberal cultural political values. Um, they're seen as an ice cream brand that um, is very much, you know, very much a, a political brand. Um, Nike in this country, particularly around the idea of sportswear and, and women, I showed you, or you, you looked at the clip before, are very much, even though it's a global juggernaut, um, very much embedding themselves in the notion that they have to be, they will be, they have to perform their ethical credentials, at least try to perform their ethical credentials to consumers. Okay, my last clip. And then we go to a Q&A and I apologize for running a bit over time. This is H&M. This again is from, um, this is from last week. So again, another COVID moment, COVID development moment brought to you by COVID. Um, this is H&M and their campaign is very much uh, of the essence. It's called Let's Change for Tomorrow, right? Uh, again, they've realized that in this COVID moment, there's been some sort of a discussion around globalism and the place of global brands in consumer culture. And um, they're trying to announce their bona fide commitment. I care, I say it, and I use bona fide sort of inverted commas. They are doing good things. I'm not trying to say they're not. Uh, but they're trying to announce their ethical initiatives in this moment of um, when, when globalism and indeed fast fashion is being contested. So I'll throw it over to Professor Anuj to share the clip. It's, uh, I think, 20, 30 seconds, and then I'll come back to a short discussion. To everyone, please refer to the chat box again. I have just shared the link for video five. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So I hope you've viewed the short clip. Um, as you can see, they're very much trying to announce in this, this, this was from last week, they're very much trying to announce their bona fide, their, their commitment to uh, ethical practices. And, you know, it's the idea that by purchasing and wearing, of course, H&M, we ourselves as consumers are engaging in a socially conscious act of ethical behavior. Um, having said that, I mean, this is the way consumption for the most part or ethics through consumption is played out. Only a tiny minority will more deeply inquire into H&M's activities and hold them to account um, and, and change their own behavior. We, for the most part, have entered a moment where we are happy through our consumption to engage in, through our consumption of ethical brands or brands that display their ethical bona fides. We're more than happy to display our own sense of ethics, signal that socially, signaling that socially through this form of consumption. Okay, last slide. So as you've seen, um, if we talk about five ways that going forward, we will um, engage with branded products and services. Well, the first is that we're going to look at an increased sense of socialized brand meaning. That has become so apparent through the ways we interact with our friends and relatives on WhatsApp, Zoom, Teams, we link, right? We create linking value through even these apps and platforms, right, at the most mundane level in this COVID moment. And I don't think that's going to change. 
I think these are, as I said earlier, to begin this presentation, these are nascent trends that have been amplified through the cracks in consumer culture that have been developed through COVID. The cracks were there, sort of, that they've been widened and amplified these trends. Um, there'll be a greater sense of linking value with brands. Brands understand that people are far more displaced and fractured and anxious. And their job is to, as for example, the Coca-Cola campaign, bring people together. We will continue to perform global modernity, particularly in places like India, where the global is a, an aspiration, right? Um, that would, could be born out of the, 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 the post-colonial experience of citizens in this country, but it's still a huge aspiration for large swaths of the world's population. I don't see that going anywhere. Um, the flip side will be those who perhaps can afford the, dare I say, luxury of not buying into, they themselves will perform their own anti-consumption identities, but they will resist and the, both the process of globalism and the ideology through various uh, practices of their own. And of course, one thing coming on from that, stemming on, I think most of us will hold brands to far more ethical account than we have in the past because uh, we do see right now the fractures, perhaps even the ways that you know, good brand behavior has helped us you know, create stronger linkages with our families and friends. And as I say that, here I am, I've been living on campus for the last, uh, I've moved from Tulip for the last nine weeks and uh, there's about 10 of us here on campus and I link every day to my friends and relatives abroad using marketplace resources like brands and products and services through apps. And that helps me for the most part keep sane. And I'm sure that the, 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 the case is for all of you as well. That's it for me. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for listening. Uh, I know we have gone a bit overboard with time. Um, if you have any questions, now's probably the appropriate moment to field them to Professor Anuj and um, we'll go for a short q and A. I I imagine. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Lucknath. I think they, these were valuable insights. Uh, you know, if I very quickly synthesize uh, the points that you've made in terms of some very valuable readings pertaining to consumer and cultural anthropology, uh, you talked about socio-cultural approaches effective bra affecting brands how brands contribute to social identity, brand consumption beyond crisis, and towards the towards the last, you talked about ethical brands. Now we have a couple of questions. I I'm sure even you would be able to see them on your screen because few of them are sort of uh, you know pretty long. So I would read out the questions for you in case yeah, you have sure. any any issues in terms of uh, you know understanding the question i would suggest you also you know may have a look as far as the chat window so the first question is from ravina gupta who is uh, a manager at linkedin and what she says is you know do you believe that uh, the pandemic uh, would create a new norm as far as consumer consumption is concerned with specific focus on the mom and the pop stores in india Regarding the new norm, regarding, can you just read out the Yes. Last? So, do you believe that the pandemic, which is COVID-19, would create a new norm as far as consumption is concerned, with special reference to the mom and pop shops uh, in India? Yeah. Okay. So, so this sort of question, we, we need to think about segments and audiences here. Who are we talking about? Which, which sort of particular target audiences are we talking about? Because um, if we are talking to mum and pop stores and, uh, and if we are talking uh, the COVID and post-COVID moment, I think there's going to be changes in the short term to how those stores um, run. I don't think they're going to go away, if that's what you're asking me. I think there will be ways through which 
uh, um, customers of the stores, for example, they'll build in processes through which the customers of the stores, for example, will, you know, for example, have to line up or they'll have quotas on number of people per store at any one time. There'll be extra expenditures, and this might in, eat into the budgets of, as you said, a mom and pop stores, extra, extra expenditures on um, facilitating those things to occur. It might be extra expenditures on cleaning, for example, and ensuring that their store is um, at least sanitized for business, you know, in, in, in a post, immediately post-COVID world. But I certainly don't think they're going to go away if also, I, I, you know, and when you say the new norm, um, one of the wonderful things about being a consumer anthropologist is thinking about hygiene in this country. And I want you to think about, and you're, you're, you're in the world of marketing as well, Rabina, and uh, uh, I want you to think about, and you know Indian culture far more than I do, but I would throw the question back to think about the levels of hygiene of consumers for mom and pop stores. And indeed, is it feasible that there's going to be a social change regarding hygiene practices over the next five years with regard, three years, say two years, with regard to hygiene practices of customers who frequent these stores? My feeling is not a great deal is going to change in that regard. We can use all the sanitizer we want. We can use all the face masks we want. But culturally, I think there's got to be far more than just that. There's got to be long-term effective social change programs to effectively change social habits. Um, so I, I really don't think that that's going to change. I do think that these stores will have to, for the short term, spend more effort in making sure their stores are safe and, and safe for customers to attend. All right. I, I hope uh, Professor Lucknath has been able to answer your question, Ravina. In case you would still have any queries, you feel free to type in your, uh, you know, for the question, we might take it towards the end. Now, the second question, Professor Lucknath, is from Garima Saxena. I've also, uh, you know, messaged you the uh, question uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, specific to your mailbox and it is there over the common window as well. So you might want to sort of have a look at the question as well. Meanwhile, I also read through the question. What uh, Mr. Garima is asking is brand value for consumers in terms of uh, symbolic membership to groups and enhancement in their images are forms of hedonic value. Post COVID-19, do you see a change, either an increase or decrease, in how consumer will seek hedonic value from brands rather than utilitarian value products offer? Yeah, so, yeah, I do. I mean, that's what uh, essentially my last slide. So my last slide here really hits this on the head. Um, I. I you know, the hedonic value is linked to these five, five issues. That's the value. Now, we're talking two different languages. Hedonic value is a function of consumer psychology. And I'm coming from the uh, completely different area, but I am uh, touching on essentially, if I talk about the analog concept, th this is the hedonic value, not the utilitarian value. We are talking social value here. Right? How brands will perhaps enable us to become closer, bring us closer together, right? What's that sort of experiential value that we get? So we are talking different languages because the, the, the theoretical framework from where you're asking that question is it's derived from consumer psychology and where I'm coming from, it's derived from consumer sociology, anthropology, but essentially, these four points on the screen here very much touch on that. So yes, I very much agree that that will happen. Rather right. than, the, can I just explain just, rather than the sure. sort of functional utilitarian value that, uh, um, that a brand traditionally from the brand, um, dare I say it, 
the, the, the typical brand um, management perspective is utilitarian, but we are going to see the hedonic value um, become more important uh, as we go through. All right, fair enough. Uh, the third question is by Professor Minakshi. Uh, professor Minakshi is an assistant professor at General Global Business School, and I would request Professor Minakshi if she could unmute herself and ask the question directly to Professor Laknath. Thank you so much, Anuj, for uh, providing this opportunity. And thank you so much, Professor Laknath, for walking us through this insightful presentation of yours. So <laughs> I have uh, two questions. I'll go on with the first question first. Uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, these days, many brand houses are dependent on the bot to give them cues to curate their products better. Uh, what kind of impact do you think this has on overall brand value and individual social identity, especially when the marketers are diving deep to make these products customizable? Okay, so <clears throat> so this is a big this is a big tension. In fact, in my class just this week. I showed a wonderful clip from a fellow. Sorry, I'm just going to pop up. Um, I showed a clip this week from um, he's a mate of mine, actually. He was a CEO and founder of one of the big um, data brand uh, audience research firms in, in England, Casper um, Schlickham. And he was the founder and CEO of Zaxis, part of the WPP group. And Zaxis. Uh, is their, their, their platform is there to provide what they call program, pro, programmatic marketing for their clients. Real time, right? And they do use an AI based framework to do this. Real time um, using data generated through things, things like this, the smartphone or the tablet or whatnot. They generate data and they are very quickly and uh, uh, easily able to offer up to consumers, as you say, curate products that better serve their needs at that moment. He then goes on to talk in that clip that I show in class. That's fine and that's wonderful, but what does this do? He talks about the need to have what he calls, that's fast marketing, right? Big data. You know, big, it's funny how big data has moved off the radar. The discourse has shifted, but essentially big, big data and big tech and, you know, now it's AI and, and all of this. But he says, and that's fast marketing. Programmatic, here you are. Something comes up on my screen. I'm in the market for pizza. Wow, shit, I've got an ad for pizza here. Let's go and purchase, right? But what he also says is there's got to be a need for slow marketing. And what he means by that is this idea of branding campaigns that set the scene for the organization to fully, um, fully articulate its brand values to consumers. It's not just about sales and retail. It's also about having a value proposition and enabling through the art of storytelling enabling that storytelling, sorry, that value proposition that's wrapped up in, you know, as I, uh, as I have shown here in my presentation, wrapped up in a minute to a minute and a half piece of brand communication, um, something that offers the consumer more than just a moment to purchase. There has to be some broader sense or linkage because otherwise we're just, the firm is just not going to be able to develop an identity, a consistent brand identity uh, around itself and trade on brand value, it'll be trading on functional value of what it offers. So it's a big tension, but um, yeah, I think that's, brands are very well aware that apart from the sort of problematic fast marketing aspect, they need to work at slow marketing. Uh, uh, continuing with uh, this particular aspect of brand, uh, my second uh, question is somewhat related. So when we talk about luxury brands like H&M, Louis Vuitton, 
Burberry until 2019 were burning their unsold goods in order to maintain exclusivity to what they were serving to the market. Do you think that post COVID these companies uh, will have the freedom to continue with this exercise, especially when uh, people, as you said, uh, you know, most of the consumers are getting back into the shoes of becoming minimalists, eh? And looking ahead at sustainable consumption. Um. <clears throat> So, what I sense is going on here uh, with their behaviours uh, is is indeed something you know hugely. Um, you know, you can talk about ethical practices by firms and so on, as you say, burning their 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 wares to maintain exclusivity, <coughs> rather than it sort of being down, sold down the market. But I also think that they're two different plays, this notion of minimalism and sustainability um, are two different plays. They're, they're sort of working at two different levels. Uh, I don't think the, the target audience for minimalist practices and what we might, you know, minimalist practices, we'll call it that, will be necessarily going toward luxury brands, right? They may, and again, we have to look at the class fraction. I haven't talked about that. There's a huge level of class dynamics that play into this, uh, levels of cultural capital and so on. So again, I, I, we have to be careful about segmenting different, audience, different audiences for luxury brands. They're not an amorphous group. But if we are talking those who are moving toward more minimalist, sustainable consumer practices, and luxury brands very much target their offerings to those segments, not exclusively to those segments, might I say, but target to those segments, right? Then they have to be careful about managing their supply chain and what happens, you know, either down or right. further on. But that that yeah, we have to be careful because they are targeting different groups at the same time. So that's one conversation they're embedded in and managing the brand. But there's a whole another group that they're targeting and managing. But that group really doesn't care about minimalism and sustainability. They're, they're, they're not, that's not what they work from, right? So it depends on the target audience, target audience fraction being... Um, considered. All right. I hope Professor Minakshi, uh, Professor Lakshmi was able to answer your question. Uh, moving on to the next question is by Dr. Parul Bhandari. Now, uh, Dr. Bhandari is an associate professor in sociology at General Global Business School. And I would request her if she could use her mic to directly ask questions to uh, Dr. Lakna. Dr. Parul, are you there? Uh, you just might have to unmute yourself. It happens a lot of times. I don't think she's here. Well, I think she is, but... Okay. Uh, well, she just got... I, I think I, I couldn't unmute myself because you probably oh, didn't sorry, allow me to. Thanks, Anuj. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, Laknath. It's really like what a fantastic lecture. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for giving such a good um, overview of, uh, of all the important points. And I, I was beginning to think, okay, what are the, there's so many questions that came up into my mind. And I'm sure that you basically couldn't uh, cover everything because of the time constraint. But here I go, just a few things. Um, the first one that I was just thinking of was, um, we obviously spoken a lot about sort of the social embeddedness of brands. Uh, but I'm also thinking if you can comment on, um, in some ways, the precarity of brands and uh, brand images. And I'm thinking of this 
mainly because of the current situation, not only the pandemic, but uh, George Floyd riots. And I'm sure you're, uh, you've read of it yourself that in Portland, um, uh, they, like all of these big brands were attacked and Louis Vuitton store was actually looted. So I was just wondering at times, and it, it's, times it's in times of these crises that the responses to brands is, becomes really interesting. And you touched upon class inequalities and class right uh, uh, while answering uh, Minakshi's question. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about it, which is that how people, um, people look at these brands as also symbols of kind of inequalities. And of course, we're talking about high luxury brands here and the Gilets Jean movement in France did the same, like at that point, um, all the shops and sort of close to Chaux were, were attacked, which were the high brand, um, high brand shops. So one on that precarity in that sense, but also precarity in another sense, which is uh, Burberry. So sometimes uh, merely by consumption, you can actually bring down brands, as it were, completely. So, um, uh, what do you? Uh, what would be sort of a comment? Uh, I'd be very interested to know what you think of that. And the second question uh, that I have is kind of related to the um, the ethical point that you were making, points on ethics that you were making about virtue signaling. And I was, I just so many other examples came up to my mind. You know, with what happened with Dolce and Gabbana and Gucci, the kind of attack that they came under due to racism. And I was just wondering that, are we? kind of in a space where we are pushing brands to virtue signal more? Are they really, really becoming ethical or is it the sort of force of, they're forced to be politically correct and then they make these slips. And in some ways that also shows the power of consumers. And uh, uh, you've kind of touched about the, uh, the ethical part and if you could speak a little bit more about it, because I'm also thinking of someone like Stella McCartney and she starts this whole eco-friendly line, but I wonder how, how popular she is and whether popular or rather high fashion brands such as the Louis Vuittons and the Hermes would be actually ever, ever, ever able to make this shift to eco-friendly products. And the third, and I just say, I'd probably say the last um, question would be, do you think, now this is a very uh, <laughs> controversial, not controversial, but like a big question. Do you think we would ever move to a place of post-brand culture? And I say this because a few studies suggest that at least in Western Europe, um, there is now a move or a shift away from brands. Uh, and I suppose in some ways this links to the question of um, precarity of brands. I have another question, but I think I'll just keep it no, for later. It's nobody no, else. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll discuss. We'll discuss. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Laknath. And yeah. just, yeah, thanks so much. Just wanted to know what you think about these points. Cool. Thanks. That's four questions. <laughs> okay. Um, shit. <laughs> Which one do I tackle first? Um, okay, precarity of brands. Um, symbols of equality, Paul, and... Let's just talk about, I, 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 I had a moment on my slides where, particularly around uh, brands as, uh, the, you know, let's go back, sorry, my things are sticking again. Um, this one, right? This slide, brand consumption as resistance to global modernity. Um, The protest is interesting. I don't want to talk about the protest uh, in particular because it's really about police brutality against, it, actually, we look at it for what it was. It's an instance of police brutality. But overlaying that is an instance of harassment by authorities of Afro-Americans. Overlaying that, no, not even overlaying, adjacent to that but feeding into that or what I would call hangers-on that want to get their message into now the global media that has spotlighted uh, Minneapolis and other parts of the world, the parts of the US where, the, where you know, America is burning. They're feeding in their protest movements into this. So I think you have to separate these things out. I mean, come on, just yesterday I was watching some news item uh, about the protest, and in the background I see three rainbow flags and a uh, pro-LGBT sign, and I'm like, come on, man, like, that's not even relevant, right? Do you know what I'm saying when, when we talk about that? So I think we have to split out, separate out what are the particular protests moments and movements that are enjoining this one instance of protest against police brutality uh, and harassment of Afro-Americans 
because others aren't joining in the way that, you know, um, <clears throat> Naomi Klein's no logo fit into a whole host of anti-globalization movements. And I use that because each one had their own thing to say, but they all enjoined into something that we now call the anti-globalization movement, but it's composed of splinter, very much splinter um, issues. That's the first issue. Then you were saying, talking, and I think this is what you said about pre the precarity of brands and sort of Burberry and bringing down brands. Do you mean by the fact that they're targeting the wrong audiences? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Or, you know, like, you know, there's this in the UK, the, the Chav phenomenon, you know, the sort of working class that has the cashed up Chav in Australia, we call, no, I shouldn't say that, that's a bit derogatory, but we do call them cash up bogans in you know the popular press bogan is an uncouth working class fellow who's made a lot of money and now demonstrates that through their conspicuous consumption so you're referring to that the chaps that are purchasing burberry as we know and therefore what that does the chaps in england uh what that does to the brand uh, i'm not sure if that's what you mean, but indeed, if that's what you mean, then yes, for sure, that has the potential to shift the brand meanings. And, uh, and, and again, brand managers have to be very careful about, I mean, this is a big tension, right? Once a brand is launched, you have no control over it. You can manage it, but consumers and audiences have also fair play on the meanings as well. And they can sometimes shift it to invert the intended brand meanings. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry, I was, I was unable to unmute because I think I need authority, authorization. <laughs> yes, you're right. That's, uh, that's what I meant. Essentially, yeah, I basically cool. was trying to say that how consumers can completely change brands as well, because we're, we're talking about a lot about how brands are yeah. shaping, can shape or embed themselves in cultures or also shape cultures, but it's moments of, yeah, so uh, sort of like that. Yeah. Cool. Let's move on. There's a few more questions. Um, uh, ethics. Um, yeah, of course, brands are, I think brands as another particle of, consume, of culture are embedding themselves in various ways, in the ways that culture appeals to various segments. There's different types of music I listen to and different artists I listen to dependent on their perhaps social, political, cultural affiliations and what values they espouse. Brands are no different. And brands have, since Doug Holt's work, the one I mentioned earlier, how brands become icons, it very much is about this, how brands insert themselves in, into cultural fracture, fracture points, as he puts it. Um, that's not his phrase, that's my phrase. But he talks about how there, there's cult fracture points in society and brands then, you know, pick pick a moment and dare I say pick a side depending on their audiences and who their audiences are. So that gets that one. In terms of post-brand culture and um, uh, no, no brand culture, um, yes and no, that's still a brand culture. Unicoi very much is a you know brand like that, no logo, but we all know it's Unicoi. Um, and you know, so I, I don't think brand culture is going away. Um, I think the luxury to not purchase certain brands, but purchase others, you're right, is not just a Western phenomenon. Um, we are seeing it in the more affluent demographies of BRICS countries and developing countries where people are like, and there's a whole vast literature on this, you know, we all play status games through brands, all of us do if we're embedded in a consumer culture. And those who have high cultural capital sort of move off playing the brand game and move, but, but display, move off the obvious brand game, the sort of chunky Polo Ralph Lauren, Lauren, Polo Ralph Lauren logo on my um, breast pocket to going, oh, I'm into certain types of hip hop or rap or house music. You know, we, we display our cultural capital in different ways once we, have acquired certain um, <clears throat> accoutrements and education levels from the market. Okay, moving on. Um, 
All right, very quickly. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Laknath, and thank you so much, Parul. Those were some really good questions. Uh, let me tell you. Now, moving on, uh, I think we have a couple of more questions, but because of the time constraints, unfortunately, uh, we will not be able to take on those questions specifically written by, I think, Mr. Galif Bhushan, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, <laughs> and Komal Chaudhary. But what we will do is, and I can assure you of that is, uh, you know, we will get in touch with Professor Laknath after this and make sure that we highlight your question to him and perhaps we uh, get back to you uh, as far as the responses are concerned. So my sincere apologies for that. Uh, it's again because of the time constraint that we have to cut short. But I can assure you, we will get back to the answers to the questions that you have asked uh, uh, both of you. Uh, now, very quickly, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Laknath, for taking up thank time you. Thank you. and providing uh, such valuable insights on, on such a relevant topic. I, I would also, towards the end, like to thank our center director, Professor Anirban Ganguly, along with all the team members for putting in, you know, uh, efforts, tirelessly putting in efforts in order to make the series, uh, the webinar series, uh, a reality. So thank you so much, everyone, Professor Chitrakalpa, Professor Menakshi, uh, Professor Chitresh. I think everyone has put in a lot of efforts in making the. Uh, the pandemic lecture series uh, a reality in what it is. Uh, lastly, I would also like to thank all the participants for being an amazing audience. I think your question certainly brought in uh, a different perspective as far as the discussion for today was concerned. Uh, and towards the end, uh, do visit our webpage as well because we have already posted all the webinars that we have conducted so far. Uh, the videos are already there, so you might want to go there and have a look at them. And do look forward for the sixth webinar that we would be conducting soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family members. Stay safe. And thank you so much. Uh, Anush, you. we'll just give uh, briefly five minutes to all the participants here to fill in the survey link that I've just shared in the chat box. So we'll precisely need only five minutes to do it. I would like to thank the participants uh, for their cooperation and we look forward to your feedback to make these uh, lecture series even more interesting with your valuable feedback. Can I just jump in there, um, Prof Anuj, and say if anyone wants to contact me, um, my email address is there on the uh, final slide. So just drop me an email I'll, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think that'll be great for Mr. Galav and uh, uh, Komal. You can Komal. straight away ask your questions to Professor Laknath. Uh, so that sort of takes care as far as your questions are concerned. And everyone else, all those who are there, uh, if you can just quickly take out five minutes as suggested by Professor Minakshi to fill in the survey. Uh, we would be really grateful to all of you.